Um, so I'd like to welcome you all, friends, colleagues, current students, alumni, and other members of our community to our fall distinguished lecture. My name is Karen Nelson. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a professor here in our environmental engineering program. And it's my honor and privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Dick Luthi from Stanford University. And I also want to welcome his wife, Mary, who has joined us. Thank you for coming. We're delighted you could join us. So Professor Luthi's career actually began here at Berkeley. So he's showing his true blue colors. There's a little bit of red hidden, hiding there in the stripes on his shirt, but we'll look past that. Um, he was an undergraduate student here in chemical engineering. We'll forgive you for that too. And graduated with his bachelor's degree in 1967. And then I just learned um, he was interested in the ocean, the ocean. So he made his way over to Hawaii for his master's degree. Um, and then he actually spent a few years as a diver in the Navy. This was during the time of the Vietnam War and the draft. Um, before eventually realizing that how he really wanted to apply his love of chemistry and water was in the field of environmental engineering. So he returned to Berkeley and received his PhD here in our program in 1974. And in fact, he is now a member of our Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Um, he was inducted in 2012. Um, Professor Luthi started his career as a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in 1975. And it was there that he established his reputation as a leading researcher in developing strategies for cleaning up sediments contaminated with persistent organic pollutants. In other words, different classes of contaminants that accumulate in sediments because of their hydrophobicity. And they are resistant to degradation by natural processes. So initially, Dick's research focused on byproducts from coal processing, and then later polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which result from petroleum combustion, and then polychlorinated biphenyls, which are insulators widely used in the electronics industry. And it was during this time, in, ad in addition to his teaching, research, and mentoring of students, that he also began his long career of service and leadership. For example, from 1986 to 1988, Dick served as the president of the Association of Environmental and Engineering Science Professors. And for all of his contributions, in 1999, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. But that it sounds like a great honor, but it actually, actually uh, asks you to give a lot back. So he has been continuously giving back to the National Academies. Um, for example, he served as the chair of the Water Science and Technology Board and recently chaired a National Research Council committee on the beneficial use of stormwater and gray water. In 2003, he was recruited to Stanford uh, to serve as department chair for civil and environmental engineering where he led the department for six years. And then, my impression is he could have returned to being just a professor, but I don't think he was content with that. So it was about this time that he and our colleague here, David Sedlak, started the process of uh, writing a proposal and a long sort of two-year arduous process which led to the successful launch of a National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center that many of you know well called RENEWIT, which stands for Reinventing Our Nation's Urban Water Infrastructure. And with RENEWIT as, um, as director, Dick's research and leadership expanded to encompass innovative technology and policy-oriented approaches to make our urban water infrastructure more sustainable. So he is a thought leader on this topic, both in California and around the world. And that is going to be the, the topic of his talk tonight. So I'm not gonna say anything more about that. I don't wanna steal his thunder. But I wanna talk a little bit more about Renew It. So because for me personally, Renew It has been one of the highlights of my career. So I've served in a number of leadership roles at the center and that's given me the opportunity to work closely with Dick over the last eight years. And to give you a sense of, of the impact that Dick's leadership has, our center in, has included more than 50 professors and hundreds of graduate students and undergraduate students over that time. I wanna share one um, personal anecdote. About six years ago, we held a retreat for the Renewit faculty down in Asilomar in Monterey. 
And to build community and have some fun after dinner, the first night, Dick proposed that we build a bonfire on the beach and sing some old cowboy songs. <laughs> but it was too windy. So we couldn't do this on the beach. We had to come into one of the conference um, rooms indoors. But they had a fireplace. We were roasting our marshmallows on the fireplace. And nobody wanted to let Dick down. So we all joined in for a couple of cowboy songs. But then we started taking requests. And my two sons were there, who were four and eight at the time. And they were the most uh, enthusiastic to take up this um, suggestion for request, and they immediately yelled out, Gangnam Style! <laughs> <laughs> and so moments later, my husband had Gangnam Style playing on YouTube, and my sons were teaching Dick the moves to Gangnam Style. <laughs> There's even a lasso move, so it was consistent. <laughs> consistent with the cowboy theme. So I share that story to illustrate some of my personal observations from working closely with Dick over these last eight years. He has a very people-oriented leadership style, and he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He's a leader in whom everyone has unwavering confidence, and he's extremely dedicated to his profession, to education, to mentoring, and to using his position to have positive impact. Um, I should note that Dick personally has advised more than 60 PhD students and postdoctoral scholars so far in his career. And I just want to mention a few more types of recognition that he's received. In 2005, he was awarded the Einstein Chair Professor by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. In 2013, he was elected a Fellow to the Water Environment Federation. And in 2015, he received the Gordon Maskew Fair Award from the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. So please join me with a warm welcome for Professor Dick Luthi. Okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. You are great. Okay. Well, thank you, Carr, for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see. I have as much authority here, authority here as I do at Stanford. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is uh, is talk to talk about sustainable urban water supplies for California, and do this in the context of a little bit of a personal history. You know where we were in the state when I became a freshman at Cal, how things have changed over time, and the like. Um, I have one slide that talks about our urban water challenges, and I'll I won't. Um, go on at length of these, but I'm sure that most of you know these, these points. We have climate change, we have population increase, economic development, we have uh, uh, climate change is bringing uh, drier dry spells that we have to cope with and the like. And so these are the challenges that we have, but one on this list that you may not have thought about is the one at the bottom, and that's the water for ecosystems. Now in the past, when we thought about water in the state, it was water for agriculture and water for cities. And this, what got the short end of the stick was water for ecosystems, meaning we would dewater our rivers. So nowadays, particularly over the last say 25 years or so, we, we recognize the public trust and the common heritage that we have with respect to our waters in the rivers like the San Joaquin. And we need to provide water we, we, we can't take all, all, all the water from the San Joaquin, nor, nor the Sacramento, for example, or the Carmel River, for example. So this is a, is a need now that puts ever greater stress on our systems. And we can see that expressed in terms of water management in the Bay Delta, but also um, when we go out into the Central Valley. Now, in September, I gave a talk at UC Merced, and these are the kinds of signs you see at U, uh, in, the, in the Central Valley. Um, water means jobs. Uh, Congress created the Dust Bowl and the like. Well, clearly, their, their jobs depend on water, and that uh, water in this state has always been very contentious, and it's been on the ballot a lot. Um, most recently, in June, with Prop 68, which was passed, uh, that provided uh, uh, funding about $4 billion for parks and wetlands uh, and habitats, but also for water systems. And something coming in LA, uh, Measure W, to support uh, um, uh, stormwater management in the city and county of Los Angeles. So the water's contentious, it's on the ballot a lot. 
Uh, just uh, last month, Mary and I were in uh, Monterey and uh, <coughs> in Carmel, and I took these pictures here. And what's going on is that the, the water supply for Carmel Monterey Pacific Grove is provided by a private company, Cal, Cal Am. Now, there have been lots of problems with the water for that area, and I guess if you take maybe 15 or 20 years of frustration, the citizens think that they could do a better job than Cal Am, and so they would like to um, buy that uh, water system um, from the private company. But this is, this is on the ballot there. Another item on the ballot, which we will vote on on Tuesday, is um, Prop 3. Uh, now this is an $8 billion uh, budget item, and it's a little bit controversial. Environmental groups are split on this. Uh, League of Women Voters says no. Uh, David Lewis, Executive Director of Save the Bay, someone I know, like says yes uh, is this uh, a smart water plan or a gift to farmers well we can talk about this in q a but it has a lot to do with this place right here the Frank kern canal and who pays for the uh, rehabilitation of, of of that canal so we'll, we'll come back to the, you can come back to that in q a but i just wanted to show you some things that are happening in real time here that reflect these pressures that we have and stresses that we have in our, our system. So this is an area that I've thought about a lot. And one of the things I've learned is that it's complex, obviously. If there was any single thing we could do to uh, fix the problem, it'd already be fixed. But you know, it isn't that way because there's so many interconnections, the way forward isn't always clear. And, you know, sometimes it's possible just to get lost in the weeds. Now, uh, oh, look at that. Well, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, I have a, a very, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, well, I haven't quite figured it out, obviously. <laughs> uh, we can talk about that later. But what, what I would like to do now is to come back and to think about where we were when I became a freshman at Cal in 1963, and, uh, and where we were in terms of a state with respect to our water, and also where we were in terms of a campus. So in the, in the little abstract for this uh, talk tonight, I mentioned that fall of 63 was a tipping point. That year was a tipping point. And in, in what way? Well, it was that the campus was still very tranquil. Now, what was gonna happen in fall of 64 with the elections and all the tables that were put out with election brochures and stuff, and the administration here didn't want those uh, political tables out. Of course, that started the free speech movement. So almost overnight, the campus turned from that tranquility of 63 to now the student protests, later the student activism and the anti-war stuff that all came, but it changed almost overnight uh, here. And we've had a similar thing with respect to water. The, the way I think about water, we were also at a tipping point. We might say we were more at a high water mark in terms of how we deal with water in the state, but where we are today is a whole lot different than where we were in 1963 big changes have occurred. Now, what's happened is that just occurred over 50 years. It didn't occur over like two months, it was 50 years. So what was going on back when I was, uh, uh, when I was in high school and then going off to, to Berkeley? Well, Governor Pat Brown had just been elected governor and uh, in the fall of 58, and his is inaugural address in January 59, he says, I will soon present a water program which is rational, realistic, and responsive to the needs of all the people of the state. So we could, might call Governor Brown the architect of the Golden State, but here he is uh, you know, doing something symbolic for the building of, building of the Oroville Dam, of course the state water project and the like. He built the UC system, added more campuses and the like. Um, now, 
my folks moved to Palo Alto when I was in sixth grade, and Palo Alto is also part of this water expansion, but it came through um, some pipelines that were put behind the Stanford campus. Uh, they're called Bay Division Pipelines 3 and 4. So here's one of them that went in in the early 50s. I don't know why they posed it with a cow, but they did. Uh, <laughs> but you can see Hoover Tower back there. Now, by the time we came to, this was in the ground when we moved to Palo Alto, but what I remember is this one. This was put in during my freshman year at Cal. Here's this great big pipe. And we had a, a VW convertible at the time, and I remember driving down Unipro Serra Boulevard thinking, my gosh, I could drive my car through that pipe. Well, this was really the high water mark. It was the end of this massive water infrastructure building in the state. So this, now we go, now we got to fast forward about 50 years, and where are we today? Well, we have a different Governor Brown, which I call son of the architect of the Golden State. Now, what does Governor Brown think? Well, he's you know, trained as a Jesuit, says, small is beautiful, small is better. And he uses this expression, um, the metaphor of spaceship Earth will see us, uh, see us through the drought. And what's he talking about here is that we have to live within our means. Um, and he used this expression actually in 76 when he ran for, uh, he had a short-lived run to be president, um, you know, and he was, uh, he was referred to as Governor Moonbeam at the time, and he, you know, he's kind of laughed off the stage. Here we are in 2015, there's no laughing. It's like, oh yeah, this is right. This is how we have, this is how we have to see our future now. And so there's a, there's a long arc there, and where we are today is, I like to think we have this sort of 50-year tipping point, 50-year tipping point, towards more sustainable approaches. And I kind of show these uh, here uh, in a pictorial way. Uh, so what are the new approaches? Well, clearly, uh, ever more water efficiency. That's where we have to start. We've achieved a lot at a state, in, in, in the state, both in the Bay Area and Southern California. And then the other one is water reuse. Now, two kinds of reuse for non-potable and then for potable, meaning for public water supply. Another one is, how can we do a better job of managing our stormwater? So instead of managing stormwater for flood control, think about it as a water supply. Some communities, like San Diego, uh, are looking at, uh, well, have implemented the desalination of seawater in a big way. Uh, and then also, well, this picture here is taken down in Bakersfield. Um, at the semi-tropic water bank, and water banking plays a big role too, as well. And that, I can explain about that later. But these, were, these are the ways then that I see us uh, meeting this challenge from Governor Brown and how we're going to achieve more sustainable water supplies for, 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 for our state. So what I'd like to talk about are three things, innovative systems for, for reuse, uh, the stormwater management for, uh, for water supply <coughs> and uh, regional strategies, how we need to think about working together as communities and not sort of optimizing one city at a time, but think about regional solutions. So let's look at non-potable um, reuse. And I'm gonna show you what I call the old system. Now the old here is in quotes because it's only about 25 or 30 years old. But the older approach to um, non-potable water reuse was to build a big facility at, the, at a main treatment plant, and here I show San Jose, and then build a large system of reverse pipeline to take that um, highly treated wastewater out into the community. Now, the problem with this is several fold. Um, it's sort of, it's kind of like had its day. Uh, we just can't lay enough pipe. It costs millions of dollars a mile to lay that pipe in a city. Uh, you have to pump the water back uphill. And another problem is that this, this water and our, the water at our treatment plants near the edge of the bay suffers from infiltration and you end up with water that's too salty, uh, say for example, for long-term ir irrigation. So you have to pull in a desalination step. 
So this is, a, this is a model that's had its day. The only expansion that is coming is, say, to maybe one of the big tech campuses. Um, so what's, what's the solution here? Well, this is something we're studying at Stanford, is thinking about decentralized water reclamation. And the plan here at our campus at Stanford would be to think about water reclamation for non-potable use. That's mainly irrigation. It's all the outdoor uses of water. And what we're looking at here is since it's a new system, you can use brand new technologies, anaerobic technologies that don't require any aeration that are very energy efficient. So um, this is a pilot plant that's up and running. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but it's a combination of a fluidized bed married to membrane processes. This is a schematic of it. Now, Craig Criddle and Perry McCarty at our place are working on the microbiology of this anaerobic system. My interest here is how we take that water and make it suitable for use on the campus. So there are some challenges before us here. Um, the effluent from that is saturated methane. We have to recover the methane. Um, we need to be uh, attentive to any residual contaminants. Uh, trace organic chemicals, and this is on the minds of the uh, campus administrators that, you know, you don't want to harm students if they come in contact with that water. Um, we have to show compliance with our state uh, standards called Title 22. And then also, we, uh, this water is ammonia rich, and we can think about, all right, if we use this water for irrigation, um, could it in fact supplant the need for nitrogen fertilizer on the campus? And I think the answer is yes. So this is, this is my area of work is in this circle and on these questions down here. But now, how, how might this actually build out? Well, it happens on the campus. We have a um, lake water irrigation system. This is a picture I took about a month ago or so playing on the golf course. And this, is, this lake water irrigation system is being expanded to all areas of the campus. And it's pumped water from a nearby creek. But there's not enough water in that lake to water the campus all year. So what we are thinking about, and this is my model now and I, how it would work, you do the decentralized water reclamation here, pump that water over into this distribution system that already exists. It circulates around the campus and waters all the fields and whatnot. So this is a um, new way of thinking about non-potable reuse, decentralized systems, new technologies, reclaiming the water at the place where it's generated and needed. Now, uh, again, this is for water that would you think about all the water uses outside a building. On the potable side, that is upgrading wastewater to the point where it can be used inside a building, there's big changes occurring here as well. So this is a, um, a document from the State Water Resources Control Board about using recycled water uh, and increase it by 1 million or 2 million acre feet by 2030. That's a very, a very ambitious goal. But included in these goals is the substitution as as much recycled water for potable water as possible by 2030. Now that's a state position. And so this means taking not that water, not only using it for non-potable purposes, but for potable supply as well. This is a big deal, a position on part of the state. And so where are we now? And when we think about potable reuse in California, a lot is happening. So this picture shows um, where we upgrade wastewater to the point where it can be either put in the ground become part of the water supply or put into a reservoir to become part of our water supply. The red dots here, which are all down in Southern California, in Orange County where it started, um, are places where we have <coughs> existing um, permitted uh, groundwater replenishment systems using highly treated wastewater. But it, of interest are these blue dots up here. This is near where we live and Santa Clara Valley Water District is experimenting with this as well. 
they would like to do um, the groundwater augmentation as well. And then you know, I mentioned already problems down here in Monterey Salinas area. They're planning that, maybe Santa Cruz too. So there's new things happening there. And the green dots are thinking about putting that water in a reservoir. And most of the green dots, this is planned surface water augmentation, meaning putting the water into a reservoir. The green dots are down here in San Diego County. Why? Well, they don't have the right geology for storing water in the ground. And so pilot experiments are underway now to show how, how that could work. And the first system will put uh, highly treated wastewater into Lake Miramar. Uh, so here's, uh, uh, again, to illustrate how fast things are changing, here it is just March of this year. Um, now the state uh, uh, water board has regulations on how we should do this, on what level of treatment is needed with regard to control of pathogens, how much um, wastewater or highly treated wastewater, I should say, can go into the reservoir and what the residence time might, might be. So this is, this too, now we had 2013 with that goal, here we are 2018, we can put it in a reservoir. So a lot's happening. And then um, what I will show here is a picture down uh, for the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Um, and this shows their uh, uh, non-potable reuse, the water in the purple pipe system, and here's their plans for potable reuse and where they could possibly be. So what's, it, what's of interest here, so I met with some graduate students at lunch, and um, they're after lunch, and they said, you know, what are important areas to work in? And one of them is in this area of potable reuse. If you look where all the growth is, for the case of uh, uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, it's all on potable reuse. Now, there's a little bit of growth here on, on this side for the purple pipe. And those are to the tech campuses predominantly. Apple uh, has that big campus that looks like a spaceship. They paid themselves to build a purple pipe from Sunnyvale over to their tech campus. And Google is, do, is considering the same kind of thing. So the growth there will be a few big customers, not that um, highly de uh, that, that, that tree that I, I showed earlier. So a lot happening now, a lot of changes occurring in uh, non-potable um, uh, reuse and in potable reuse. The other way we can think about augmenting our drinking water supplies is to try to capture our storm water. Now the way we've managed storm water in California is to treat it as a flood control problem. And so our, um, our streams, our rivers are often uh, channelized and uh, and, and filled with concrete. So they don't look anything like a river anymore. In fact, uh, you know, in all these Hollywood action movies, there's often chase scenes in these rivers like the LA River and stuff like that. Um, but what, what we can do here is think about all this water that's going to um, the ocean is that, is that, and, uh, and capture that. Uh, and say, why, why should we let this run off? But we should, we should try to capture that and contribute to our water supply. Now this, this is what Los Angeles has in mind uh, in terms of capturing storm water to reduce the dependence on imported water. So if you want to know in a nutshell, you know, a simple sentence statement, what's the, what's the big goal of our water utilities in the state? It's to reduce dependence on imported water because we know in the future there's going to be less of it. Um, this baseline, we don't have to worry about the units here, but this is the baseline at say 65 right now for what's done in Los Angeles with existing spreading basins and incidental recharge. The plan is that to maybe go from this uh, 65 to 265, add on the order of 200,000 acre feet a year of water that's currently going to the ocean and put that in the ground. Now that's 200,000 acre feet a year. The city of LA uses about um, 700,000 acre feet a year. So this, this would then mean that by this, if this is implemented, they could reduce by say, uh, you know, 20% or so the need for imported water by this strategy alone. So when we think about storm water, we can look at it as, all right, this is a resource that we should try to capture and use. 
but um, how does this sit with the public? What, what, how would you talk about this? Well, there's another reason to do the stormwater capture, and that's that when you let it go uncontrolled to the ocean, you cause beach contamination. So here's some pictures I took down in Long Beach. Um, here, um, a large chamber is being built to take um, stormwater from Signal Hill and parts of Long Beach to put it in this chamber and have it percolate in the ground and become part of the water supply. Um, this happens to be it's being built at the edge of the uh, Long Beach Airport. And this is a sign that advertises the project. But look at what it says. Protect our beaches. City environment better for all. It doesn't say, you know, we're going to capture a thousand acre feet a year of stormwater or stuff like that. It's all presented on the idea that if we do this, we'll have healthier city and healthier beaches. And, you know, this is an important message to me in all that we do on the waterfront. Is you need to think about not just one benefit, but when you have multiple benefits, those are the projects that get built and funded like this. In an area that uh, Dave Sedlak and I, and Mark Toshito and others have been working down in Los Angeles is in the Sun Valley neighborhood. Now, um, this is Goleta Street. The Sun Valley neighborhood is near um, the Burbank Airport. So I'm standing here and I take a picture of this street. And what I want to show here is when the San Fernando Valley was built up after World War II, here's what these streets look like. Now, the question is, what's missing? Well, there are no curbs, there are no sidewalks, uh, there's, there's no stormwater system there. So one of the things the city is looking at is now going back and um, retrofitting the city, to, uh, this area, these neighborhoods, to collect that stormwater. So if I turn the camera around and uh, look on Laurel Canyon Boulevard, three test systems have been put in place uh, called dry wells to capture the na the, that neighborhood runoff from a few city blocks and percolate it in the ground. And uh, I'll have some pictures to show later. Uh, but what I want to illustrate here is what do we see? We see a sidewalk now where there wasn't sidewalk. And by the way, Laurel Canyon Boulevard is a very busy street. We have a curb here, you know, that's nice so that little kids on their tricycles aren't going to go rolling off into the street. Um, we have a planted bed here that uh, helps beautify that, that street. And so when we look at this then, now these are a little bit expensive to put in because you're putting in infrastructure that should have been in there in the first place. But these are the kinds of things that a community looks at and then they'll say, we, we support this and we're going to pay for it. On the Stanford campus, um, we have taken some play fields on the west side of campus, some big uh, practice soccer fields here. Um, these are um, down about five feet. And this is a place that can serve as a stormwater, a stormwater detention basin to capture that water. And then it can be pumped up to that lake that I referred to in that lake water irrigation system. So in the winter time, you can capture the stormwater put a pump in and then pump that water backwards up to the lake. And by the way, this volleyball court here uh, first treats that storm water. Down a couple feet here are, uh, are some infiltration pipes and this volleyball court sand depth is maybe about six or seven feet and it acts as a sand filter before the water goes off into this uh, 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 system. So this helps control the hydro modification. And these, these kinds of systems then that are built to capture for about half, well, a quarter of the campus, I guess, uh, means that uh, we're satisfying the requirements for stormwater management uh, for, the, well, for the foreseeable future. And another one of these is being built on the east side of campus. I, I've shown you these systems here, and there's a question about the scale and cost. We live in a Mediterranean climate, and so that means that, you know, of course, it rains for about four or five months, and then the rest of the year it doesn't rain. So there's a question about where do you, how, how, how do you hold that water? Well, it's just not possible to build a tank big enough. It's not really feasible to build a big tank. Some people may have rain barrels, but 
those serve an educational purpose, I think. They're mainly empty all year. Um, if you build a cistern, that becomes very expensive. Um, this is a picture of spreading basins in LA uh, that were built some time ago and then can be rehabilitated. Uh, but you see a log scale here in terms of uh, uh, cost and against the volume of water captured. And somewhere, when you think in terms of about 10 acre feet a year or so, it becomes economical to invest in this urban infrastructure. Invest. Now, who pays for this? Well, this brings me back to this issue of Measure W in LA. Uh, and it's on the ballot. We'll find out if it passes on uh, Tuesday. I hope it does, because uh, we're getting sponsorship from LA and other agencies down there for our stormwater work. And if this gets passed, they'll have money for that. Um, but the, the idea is to have a tax of two and a half cent per square foot of impermeable space. Uh, and that means like your roof area, for example. <coughs> so for a home, it might be $80 a year or something, which isn't very much, but there are a lot of homes. The end result would be that that could contribute um, maybe about $300 million a year in revenue to deal with, with stormwater. Right now, we don't have mechanisms to deal with stormwater. We have a water bill, a wastewater bill, but we don't have a stormwater bill. So this is a, this is a way then to fund that. Uh, $300 million a year sounds like a lot, but there are a lot of blocks, uh, a lot of area that needs to be um, uh, b uh, that needs to be addressed. The other problem with stormwater is I mentioned the contaminants. You have pathogens, uh, biocides, vehicle related compounds. And before we put the water in the ground, we want to make sure that we're not causing a groundwater contamination problem. And uh, we've been doing field work in Sonoma and down in Los Angeles, in which we have uh, set up columns in the field to look at different kinds of media that could filter the stormwater and take out these contaminants. Um, I was working with uh, uh, columns with wood chips and biochar and David Sedlak with manganese and his students. And, um, and this are, these are ways in which we can assess whether or not we can build a smarter stormwater recharge systems with uh, not too expensive but useful material to filter that stormwater. It's important here in all this work that the columns are aged in the field for a period of time, in this case, eight months. They take that water and they're just processing it. So if there's any fouling or biological growth, that all has a chance to occur before we um, do tests with, uh, with particular organic compounds. And so this is a result from tests in which we had um, wood chips and biochar together. Um, and removing a whole suite of compounds here. Uh, uh, essentially, for all, all the compounds, you, just, you get 100% removal. And we can model this and think that for a city like Santa Rosa, uh, you, may, you could put systems in place that might last for about, uh, well, 10 years or more before you'd have to change the media. Well, something else would probably happen in that time span in which you would have to do some maintenance anyway on the system. In the area that we're working down in Los Angeles is um, to take this former sand and gravel pit uh, and convert it into a, a stormwater capture and recharge system. So that's how the picture, that's how it looks today. The plan would be that this will be, this land, it's almost 50 acres been bought and is being converted to this system now that will have a uh, detention pond for stormwater and wetlands. But you see a jogging path or, and the like, tot lots, uh, play fields, and that sort of thing. So you take an urban blight and you convert it to a nice urban amenity. And this is expensive, all right? It's about 50 million bucks or so. Half of that is just to buy the land. Even a dump's expensive in Los Angeles. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of support for this, and you can see the, the groups that are involved here. So what we're doing, and I'll use the royal we again with uh, David Sudlack's students and my students working collaboratively, is to think about how we could take the effluent from a system like this, run it through a filter media so that when it uh, 
goes into the ground in this area, it's, it's cleansed. And the questions are how much biochar, what infiltration rate, and are the bacteria doing anything beneficial? So we've set up and are testing down in LA uh, a series of columns here in the Sun Valley neighborhood. And the, just beyond that fence there off to the right, that's that area, that 50 acre site that's undergoing this uh, uh, conversion. So the idea then was build columns, uh, percolate stormwater through the columns down here uh, in LA for a period of time, then bring the columns back, in this case to Stanford, and then do a series of challenge studies with trace organics. And they're shown here, um, they're herbicides, insecticides, corrosion inhibitors, and stuff like that, a mix of different kinds of compounds. Now, in this case, we wanted to not use as much biochar as we did up in Sonoma. So we have just a little bit, 5% by weight with sand or 0.5%. And with the low amount of biochar, you see some of the uh, breakthrough for the anionic compounds here. But this kind of information then helps us with modeling the systems and implementing uh, a feasible design for a place like uh, that Sun Valley neighborhood. We can take the same ideas now and uh, apply them to these um, uh, dry wells uh, that I referred to earlier. And here, a dry well really doesn't do very much right now. They're just holes in the ground. One's a kind of a crude sedimentation tank. Then you have two holes in the ground. These are concrete cylinders open at the bottom uh, to put water in the ground. But there's no pollutant removal here other than what may be associated with, with particles. So our goal, and this is what we've proposed to uh, Los Angeles, is to really jazz these up and think about a system in which you have sorbent media, again, maybe biochar and sand. You have uh, flow meters so you can measure how much water you're actually recharging. They don't even measure that now. Um, and then you could make these sort of smart flow meters so that you could either run water through the filters a little bit quicker or a little bit slower, depending on what, you, what information you get from um, weather forecasting. So that's where we hope to go with our new work down in Los Angeles. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was about regional strategies and how you can think about systems that work together. So I've described uh, stormwater management and uh, potable reuse as two separate systems, but we can also think about how they might work together. And my student John Bradshaw has been working on this, where we think about water recycling and conveyance then to existing spreading basins. Now the existing spreading basins in LA were built a long time ago. They have a lot of excess capacity. They take hillside runoff and percolate it in the ground, but most of the year they just look like dry beds. Well, we've studied ways in which we might think about the build out of water recycle systems integrated with the spreading basins. So the orange circles here show the um, um, uh, potential for water recycle from a number of different plants. The blue circles show an estimate of the spreading basin unused capacity. So the idea here is how do you connect up these different dots? Well, this happens to be the big wastewater treatment system for Los Angeles, referred to as Hyperion, just south of the airport. And one strategy would be to pump all the way up here. Or you could think about what are the advantages of connecting to these smaller facilities. So John's um, you know, modeled this. Um, and these are questions that are right before the city today. Should you build a, one big system down at Hyperion and pump a long ways? Or should you think about some satellite systems, in this case at Tillman and Glendale, and then pump up to, to Hansen? What this work does, it gives quantitative insights into design trade-offs and allows you to help to think about planning of the system. And it turns out with these smaller systems more inland, they're, they're, they're more cost effective. Uh, so much so that um, you know, if you look at a target that LA has for the amount that they want to spend on water, um, you end up with a number that's below their target. And so in other words, that's something they would undertake themselves. And then lastly, um, there are a number of technologies that can help make this sort of full, what we call full advanced treated water. 
It can be uh, current approaches of membrane filtration, reverse osmosis, advanced oxidation, or you could try something that's much cheaper, ozonation uh, with biological activated carbon and then advanced oxidation, or you could try some combination and see how that might work in terms of, uh, of uh, another way to sort of optimize these systems. In this case, it's optimizing around the um, uh, system that pr produces that full advanced treated water. And you could look at trade-offs here on uh, the basis of water production, uh, energy demand, and costs. And there are some limitations here to this system because of the amount of TOC it produced. So you don't get the same economies of scale. It's a little trickier problem. All right, the last one I wanted to mention was uh, um, regional strategies here. And one that I'm familiar with are the water baking operations down here in Kern County. Now in this area here, it's an area where there was a lot of cotton growing, growing earlier in the last century. Uh, and a uh, great aquifer here in the Kern River fan, but all that water was depleted. And so you have a, you have a large uh, 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 aquifer there, surface water, uh, a surface aquifer that's depleted maybe 200, 300 feet or more. Running by here, we have the California Aqueduct and the Friant Kern Canal that kind of meet down here. So this is a place where you could actually store water. And the way it would work, and this is what Santa Clara Valley Water District does, for example. Santa Clara Water Valley, water Valley District can store water down here. Now that's, a, that's 200, uh, 300 miles away from up here. So how does it work? Well, um, Santa Clara Valley Water District can forego some of the water, store it down there, and then when they need it, they take more water up here and then do a pump back down there. And these, you know, you're talking about large volumes of water and there's a pump back facility. So um, here then, this is a very cost effective way to store water. These are private enterprise here, but in the case of Santa Clara County, 350,000 acre feet. This, uh, this doesn't involve building dams. There's no real political controversy with this. Um, and when we talk about dam building, we should realize all the best sites in the states have already been built. So what I wanted to do today was to talk about this idea of this arc that we've come to from the time when I was a freshman at Cal to where we are today. It's about a 50-year arc, but a lot has happened in the last, say, 20 years, and even now in the last few years. And I've illustrated by these examples of innovative systems for reuse, the stormwater management for use, and the regional strategies. So I talked about this in terms of tipping points and uh, where we were, yes, <laughs> that's me, uh, kind of buttoned down, all right. That was before the free speech movement and you know the demonstrations and all that. Uh, well, that was then, but where are we today? Well, we've come a long way and we are looking for happy futures with our water supply and bright outcomes. So that's where we are today. And I, I thank you for your attention and I'm be pleased to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.